Well, we are one single win away from locking playoffs no matter how the outcome of Saturday's game goes. But there's a potential problem on the horizon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Rendezvous. My name is David. Let's kick this thing off. We had a series against Immortals this past weekend where the whole goal going into it was, quite frankly, 2-0. We 2-0, we pretty much guaranteed ourselves a chance at locking playoffs entirely had Shopify lost their series 2-0. Shopify ended up losing 2-1, but we did win 2-0. So while Immortals is now officially knocked out of playoffs, we are not fully guaranteed to get in yet. But how did we get there? Well, it didn't start off pretty. For being honest we had some early leads in game one versus immortals i'll actually have the graph up to the side here it was never really that substantial but we were holding our own for the most part but then uh some questionable team fights happened and we fell pretty far behind but our savior came in the form of our newest player in tomo there was a play he made in mid which caught out tactical so part mistake from tactical part really good play by tomo to cash this out but it ended up creating a 5v4 situation for a while which swung the momentum of the entire game we were able to then snowball this into baron into multiple towers and objectives and unlike immortals who when they took multiple barons throughout the course of this game they were never quite confident and able to close it out the second we got any sort of power position with those objectives yeah we closed it out with ease it was very simple to do we were able to snowball baron into elder into i think top mid and bot tap no sorry mid and bot towers as well as mid and bot inhibitors and then we were just able to close out the game as they threw a desperation hail mary because they knew they pretty much lost the game by that point so it was done and dusted now this is not a game that honestly i was expecting to win when you go down 6k gold in a match like this and you've seen how we've played in the past it was like, ah, uh, you know, at least this season or this split, it was like, okay, maybe it might not work out. But if this was spring, yeah, I probably would have more faith because we had had multiple games, including one against Team Liquid, where we were known for making comebacks and being able to pull the trigger on plays that we needed to have happen to be able to make this work. And even prior to Tomo getting the play that would eventually go on to win this game and snowball into the series win, Sniper had a really good TP flank behind Immortals, which unfortunately didn't work out, but it was one that, like, clearly we have a good eye for being able to catch out people that are a little bit hesitant in how they want to do things. So honestly, you couldn't have asked for a much better result at the end of Game 1 given the trials and turbulations that were throughout it. Which then led to Game 2 where we picked Nidalee Renekton and Yone mid, which we've been talking this entire time about how the whole goal was to have bot lane be a little bit more stable to the point where it unlocks mid top jungle to play exactly how they want. So what do we do? We put the Ezreal bot lane, something safe that they can just get through lane, and they did exactly that. They were in a losing matchup lane, which I can't even have the picture off to the side here because LOL Esports stats didn't post it for the second game, so I can't even show it to you. But our bot lane was in a losing matchup that we actually ended up going pretty much even on while topside just took over the map. Sniper and River combined for some incredible early game plays, which really set Sniper ahead, even though Sniper didn't close it out as cleanly as I'm sure he would have wanted to at the end of the day. It's a win. A win's a win. Quid looked really impressive on the Yone. Good to see him back on it. And he was going against a Marksman Lucian in mid lane. So I made the point last week of like, Maybe we can't play those types of champions. Well, apparently we might be able to. So we close it out with a very clean 2-0 win, which now puts us two games ahead of Shopify. I'll have the standings on the side here. And as you can see, we win any game, regardless of whether we lose the series or not. Shopify does not have enough wins to catch up to anybody else in the standings. Therefore, we automatically lock playoffs and we are just jockeying for seeding. Now, in an ideal world for us, and I think the expectation should be here, again, 2-0. The way the playoff bracket is set up is that third through sixth place will play each other, three plays six, four plays five. Assuming Team Liquid goes on to win their final series of the split against NRG, they will probably have first pick. They will be able to pick whoever they want that makes it through that first round. But I'll be honest with you, with how our bot lane looked this game, I feel pretty confident that we can keep it close, even against FlyQuest in the case that we do finish six. But what is the highest seed that we could possibly get? obviously not being third. Well, Dignitas is currently at fourth because they have a one game advantage over us and the same amount of losses. So in an ideal world for us, we go 2-0. Dignitas, well, they'd actually have to go uh, one and two. I mean, actually, yeah, I think they'd have to lose the series because any scenario where they get two wins, 
would automatically put them tied with us, and they have the head-to-head -head tiebreaker over us. So, but honestly, I don't really think it matters. The most likely outcome from this weekend, given the fact that NRG plays Team Liquid, is that NRG is going to lose. They're going to finish the season two and five. If assuming we win, which hopefully we should, we will finish three and four which means we will play against Dignitas no matter what. There is a case where like NRG takes a like one, two. I mean, there's a few other scenarios where we could get some sort of mix mat or like mix up between uh, Dignitas and NRG, depending on who gets that fifth or fourth C, but it, it's likely going to be us versus Dig in the first round of playoffs, which I think honestly is very winnable, but we'll get to that when it comes. First, the Shopify Rebellion preview. I hate to be smudge his name again, but Fake God had a really good weekend this weekend. Their series overall against FlyQuest was a lot closer than people were expecting and Shopify looks to be on the end but unfortunately i think it is just a little bit too late but i'm not convinced that fake god's going to be able to do that same thing against sniper whippo for whatever reason just i don't know didn't have as effective of a day and even then i don't think like fake god's advantages weren't like entirely in lane it felt like it was more in like the team fight situations and good roam timers so i'm not worried about like him performing well all of a sudden and insanity versus quid heavily favors quid river and jungle versus boogie while Boogie, I would arguably say, is actually probably better on the AP junglers than River is, or at least has like shown more prowess in terms of how he goes within Shopify Rebellion. I still think we have an advantage there. And then bot lane, well, I don't think B-Boy and Zazel have looked like incredible relative to their prior forms, but I don't think it's fair to give Tomo and Ayla the edge after a single weekend matchup against Immortals, whereas Shopify was playing against FlyQuest. Like, I, I don't think that's fair. So I think the game plan is simple, and the game plan should be this the entire way of through playoffs if we want to stand a chance at upsetting FlyQuest and like trying to steal that third seed it is going to be put bot lane on stable picks that can ultimately carry late game and go even in lane and let topside just run wild like I feel like that is going to be the best way forward for this team the best chance that we have of making it to worlds and building from the good step zones that we've already established for ourselves from this past series getting some weaker teams towards the end might actually be a blessing for our confidence that we can start ramping up and getting ready for the top teams who quite frankly just kicked our ass at the beginning but we don't have to worry about that for at least two and a half more weeks so i'm actually going to revise this particular section which was going to be out about whether 100 thieves stays or not the rumors that are out etc screw that i heard some bullshit today as everybody released their podcast into the atmosphere and i just want to call out the most absurd take that i've seen yet and actually dive into it because i don't think crap like this should just be able to be said and nobody comes back at it they are doing horribly they look like complete dog shit this split where is the narrative guys in literally any pro sport ever the entire narrative would be what, what what's going on with our MVP? What the hell's wrong with him? Why is he on this team? Why is this team so bad now? Not nah, nobody gives a shit. Like, why is there not more focus on why 100 Thieves and Quid are so bad within the LCS? What's wrong with the MVP? Why is the MVP so bad? Why is this team so bad? But we, we all know secretly in our hearts, guys, that 100 Thieves was just always terrible and Quid never deserved it, which is why we're not talking about it. Or we're just doing a disservice to the actual narratives of this league because it is crazy to me that there isn't more mention that Quid was MVP and his 100 Thieves team is fucking ass. Now, there are three specific flaws to what Monte Cristo said here. First and foremost, Quid is your MVP for spring. Whether you want to accept that or deny it, fine but you are only judging the qualifications for getting MVP of just being the regular season, of which you can argue it should have been inspired, but Quid was right there with him. Denying that and using summer or using any other period of time, regardless of when it was, as long as it is not the regular season, it does not matter. Bringing any of that up at all is irrelevant. So your point's already done there, but there's a bigger thing at play here when you specifically say, why is nobody talking about it? You see, the problem is 100 Thieves headlines over the last few weeks have been dominated by will they stay or won't they? And I don't blame particular people in the media for having that opinion. That's ultimately fine. And like them steering the conversation to that, perfectly acceptable. But let's not act like as a byproduct of that, how 100 Thieves does on the Rift goes out the window. You could probably tell that from earlier in this video where like it's this underlying fear of like, okay, great, we made it to playoffs. Are we going to exist at the end of the year? A little bit more existential crisis. But this doesn't actually just stop at this split, okay? Because this has been an ongoing problem 
for the media for a long period of time, since the days of franchising began, where 100 Thieves fans were calling out people in the media for this, but everybody just kind of ignored them. And it's that there's inherent biases against certain teams, or not even against certain teams, honestly, more just they don't care. And that's fine. You look at all the people on the broadcast, almost every single one of them has been around for a much longer period of time than franchising itself. So they inherently have seen teams come and go from the ecosystem and honestly have little faith in the new teams coming in to actually be able to make a wave. Travis probably being one of the few people that I know that's willing to give people a chance, but very quickly then will write it off rather than like kind of playing the long term. But even during the periods where 100 Thieves was good, they never really got talked about. And whenever they fell off, there was a little bit of conversation, but just in general, it seems like if your name is not Team Liquid, TSM, CLG, C9, and maybe a little bit of Dignitas because of residual value there, you don't really get talked about because all the people that are on broadcast and that are talking heads in the space have their inherent biases. So in theory, there should have been somebody that kind of came up to take the place as like a 100 Thieves placeholder within the general community, but that never happened because teams didn't embrace content creators all that well. And the one that 100 Thieves did did not turn out well. But everybody already has their inherent bias. So like when exciting headlines come up for 100 Thieves fans, like things that are big deals for us are not big deals for everybody else. So whenever you come to this fall off thing, nobody wants to talk about it. Or like they quickly write it off as like, oh yeah, we kind of knew they were bad. That's it, moving on. It's like, no, let's talk about it. Give me some stats. Give me some numbers. Don't just eyeball this. Like, I've seen Jat do deep analytical dives on why CLG isn't performing up to his first place prediction from like 2018 or why TSM is falling off or why TL is falling off. But nobody wants to talk about that for 100 Thieves. It's just the personalities, honestly. Like, there's this inherent lack of care, and that's perfectly fine. But don't sit here and say that nobody's fucking talking about it. Because point number three is that I know that you follow me, motherfucker. How are you going to sit here and say that nobody's talking about it when I'm at least doing so? And I've called everything that you've said out in prior episodes of this very series. So when you're saying that nobody is talking about it, nobody that you pay attention to is talking about it. I know I'm a nobody in the scene. I get that, but don't sit here and act like people aren't just because the same few people that you want to base your commentary and base your talking points off of haven't been saying anything. Yeah, they don't care. So look to the people that do care for your point of reference. If I'm not saying shit about it, then yeah, it's a problem. But I've specifically said in the multiple videos that I've covered this, yeah, Quid's not having as good of a summer. The entire team is not having as good of a summer. And I've broken down reasons why, but you don't fucking care. Because your whole point to begin with was that, oh, we knew 100 Thieves was bad, and yeah, it's kind of irrelevant anyway. So now when they're back to par, it's like, oh, nobody wants to listen to you to begin with because you already wrote us off from the start. I'm tired of this crap of people taking pot shots. And I get it's perfectly fine right now because there's the threat of 100 Thieves leaving the league, so everybody feels free to chuck them out right now. But you and I both know that's some bullshit. And I'm tired of people just letting this stuff go by without somebody calling out. And I know ultimately this video is not going to get enough traction to help change the narrative. Same thing with when Meteos threw out the, oh, 100 Thieves always changes their rosters whenever times are tough. For 100 Thieves, um, I'm not surprised they made a roster swap. That's kind of their bag. Yeah. Uh, it happened to me a couple times. <laughs> oh, man. Where it just seems like, you know, oh, we're not winning. Let's try something else. And if it works, you know, we're geniuses for the swap. If it doesn't work, let's make another swap till it works. Um, so I'm not surprised to hear it. It's like, well, one, yeah, teams probably should whenever there's actual problems in their rosters. But two, you look at last year, the only reason that they changed was because both Doublet and Bjergsen retired. Oh, yeah, because that's them changing by force. Prior to that, you were the same person that was criticizing them for keeping the same roster for such a long period of time and not seeing results and saying these guys aren't good enough. So make up your mind. Medios, 100 Thieves had a tough middle of the schedule. Obviously, we're a middle of the pack team that's trying to fight our way up and build our way up, but you writing us off as if we suck automatically, not Medios, that's a Monty point, ain't helping. The point is, 100 Thieves fans have known this for a long time, and everybody's finally starting to catch up on this, that the media is inherently against you if you're the newbies. You don't have anybody in the system to talk about you, so you're fighting an uphill battle. Anyways, that's it. 
Hopefully we make playoffs and we can keep talking about 100 Thieves for another week and everybody just tells me that it's not happening and nobody's talking about this at all.